welcome to another edition of Rahalas for this time with Sean Williamson. And if you enjoy these podcasts, why not become a club member? You get all kinds of benefits, including this swanky, fully plastic wallet saying I'm one of the cool kids with badges and a special cool kids card, which is folds out and there's all sorts of secret stuff in there that you're not allowed to see unless you're a member. And you get backstage interviews with all the guests and you get warnings about who the guests are going to be in case you're scared of them. I mean, you know, you get advanced warnings that you can buy tickets. Uh, lots of other things as well, and lots of other extras as well. So go to gofasterstripe.com slash badges and become a monthly badger and get all this and help us make more podcasts or come and see us on tour Go to richchain.com slash gigs and you can find out if we're coming nearby to you. Thanks for watching. It's now time for Sean Williamson on Raha Lustab. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Marlow Theatre in Canterbury. Please welcome... In Canterbury. <laughs> we can edit out later, make me look good. Please welcome a man who wishes he was in Houdini's Magic Bar. That's, that's where the cool kids go. It's Richard Herring! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Canterbury. Thank you to the Archbishop of Canterbury. His arch, his little archbishop. He's in his archbishop thrown up there, the archbishop of Canterbury. Watch out for him. Thank you. You're, you're great. God does not exist. Sorry to, sorry to blow it for you. Uh, welcome to the uh, podcast uh, that is called Richard Herring's Lesuing Sexed Tortoises podcast. It's um, new direction for me. You've got to come up with a new angle. There's so many podcasts now. You can't just have two people interviewing each other. That's insane. Uh, so what, it's a new podcast where each week people have to sex tortoises. We put about 20 tortoises of different sizes on the stage. With no previous experience, people have to try and guess what sex they are and then they have to lasso them, which is actually quite, they're so slow, it's actually quite hard to use a lasso. <laughs> then at the end of the series, we find out who was the best at sexing and lassoing tortoises. There was hanging around outside uh, Nason's department store. <laughs> Waiting for it open, it was, they weren't, the shutters were down. <laughs> really strong shutters they've got there. There was a man playing a homemade guitar, electric guitar, out of it, made out of a bit of wood. And another man, I mean, they may have dreamt this, who was selling the big issue with a cat in a tiny deck chair beside him. Did anyone else see that? Is that a local character? Or did I miss, was it a dog? I don't know, it still was in a deck chair. Anyway, both of those guys, they call it Rahela so I don't know if that's gonna, <laughs> don't know if that's gonna catch on. Um, uh, it's weird, it's a weird place here in Canterbury. Um, there's the, here's the Canterbury news of the week we record this. It's going out in quite a few months, actually. Well, it's to be out in November. Um, uh, there are plans to turn the magic chef Chinese near Westgate Towers into a pizza tonight. Uh, I'm pouring this, causing a lot of controversy here in... Canterbury. He'll be selling late night alcohol. It'll be open to three o'clock in the morning and the council are not happy about either of those things. Uh, it's met with fierce opposition. Of course, it's next door to Westgate Kebabs, which remains boarded up after the fire of 2017. It's not like all the shops in Canterbury are boarded up. We're not in Wolverhampton now, but it's, it's not looking good. How do we feel? Do we want uh, there to, be, to go back to being the magic chef Chinese cheer, if you think that? Yeah, who, who, who likes the idea of pizza tonight? Open till three, selling beer, booze. Uh, I think we've got our answer, Canterbury Council. Um, I tried to get into the cathedral today. You have to pay to go into the cathedral. That is not on, is it? That is, that's not what Jesus was about. He'd be furious about that. I just wanted to see where Thomas Beckett got twatted. That's all I wanted. They said no. Said I couldn't get in. I said, who will rid me of this troublesome cashier? No one got it. And uh, I was walking around today and look, just looking at the faces of the Canterbury residents and it's kind of weird because there's loads of people in Canterbury who seem to have been face-apped in real life. And they, it's weird, it's a weird. <laughs> then I caught a reflection of myself in the mirror. It happened to me as well. 
that's the effect of Canterbury. I should say to the people at home that when that, I did that joke, it was in uh, July, and that was so current, it was such a topical <laughs> joke. And you're listening to this in November, or maybe in a future time, and you know, the, probably the truth of Fe Face App has come out, and how evil it is. How could people laugh at that thing? It ate all our, literally ate all our faces. And uh, I've, been, I've been having a nice time. I've just turned, I turned 52 last week. It's, uh, I've been, uh, my daughter's uh, getting old enough to uh, be quite good fun now. I, I was playing with her the other day. We were playing p paper, scissors, stone. Uh, and then she got bored of that and we started playing stone, scissors, shoe. <laughs> that was the sign for shoe, which is quite easy to guess when that's coming. I have to say, the shoe, scissors beat shoes, shoe beats stone. Because you can cut a shoe and you can put a stone in a shoe. It's no more ridiculous than paper beating stone, to be honest. And then she wanted to add another one, and she added gun. Um, and uh, we decided that gun beat everything. But if both people went got the gun, it was whoever shot first. You can use it if you want. You can use that. You've got to do four of those. Before you go. Anyway, right, that is my week. Uh, let's crack on with the show. Um, my first, my only guest this week. <laughs> In fact, I'll be back next week. Do book for next week's show. The same theatre. He's probably best known for playing a paramedic on the popular soap opera EastEnders. Sometimes people shout out in the street, it's this paramedic from EastEnders. That's what they. Let's find out more about that. Will you please welcome Sean Williamson, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> it's the medic from EastEnders. Thank you. Come in. Yeah, good. Let's sit down. Come in, come in. How lovely to see you again. I just saw him backstage. Um, so people might not know you played a paramedic on EastEnders. Right, what happened was, yeah. are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> so my first job out of drama school, my agent said, I've got you an audition for a paramedic at EastEnders. He said, but it's like, whatever it is, 300 quid. And then they used to show it again on a Sunday. Do you remember that? The Omnibus, remember that? Anybody over 40? And um, he said, and you get paid again, you get paid two thirds of your money on the Sunday for the omnibus, right? So I went, great. So they faxed through <laughs> the line. I think it's going to be all right. That was the one. I think it's going to be all right. So I'm wandering around my garden for about a week. I think it's going to be all right. I think it's going to be all right. <laughs> Hang on. I think, because I'm a trained paramedic, I think it's going to be all right. I think he's going to be... Anyway, so I had all the bases covered when I turned up for the audition. So I turned up. And I got the job. Lovely uh, director called Jeff Feld. So I got the job. And he went, congratulations, you got the job. First job out of drama school. It's brilliant. He said, you can be paramedic, number one, and the ambulance driver. I went, great. Thank you. Um, great. Phoned my agent up. I said, I've got the job. He went, that's brilliant. I said, there's only one problem. He said, what's that? I said, I can't drive. <laughs> so, because I didn't learn to drive till I was 30. So, um... He went, you're an idiot. I went, I know. So he phoned up and they said, all right, he's going to have to be paramedic number two then. He's got 26 lines. <laughs> the reason why I'm telling this long, boring story is it was because they remembered me from that part when I got the audition of Barry. Right. Because you had some more lines because you couldn't drive. Yeah. Wow, it's worth <laughs> not driving. Do people shout out to you about the paramedic part? Paramedic. Is paramedic. It's either that or it's uh, Chris from London's Burning. Those two said, <laughs> doing that. <laughs> London's Burning. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sean, done well so far. Got it right twice. <laughs> I've got it written down here, just to, <laughs> just to be sure. Um, I'm, you work with my friend Al Murray at the moment. I did uh, text him to ask about you, and so uh, and I would have found this out anyway. But you didn't come to acting straight away. You were quite late to acting. I was. Uh, I, I'm a Maidstone boy, so I've always been. I, I'm, I was born in Kent, raised in Kent. I still live in Kent. I think people know this. Every time I go anywhere, people shout the word at me. So that's nice. Uh, Bob Monkhouse, 1978. Uh, um, so um, I left school. My ambition was to be an alcoholic postman. And I achieved it with, well with, with distinction. So I was one of the first, the last telegram boys in Kent uh, it was just when pesky faxes came in. So I, I joined as a telegram boy and uh, I instantly lost that job uh, because faxes came in. So uh, anyway, I was a postman for three years. Joined the Navy. Yeah. Uh, I was in there for about a year. Uh, uh, they found out I was colour blind. 
I think it was a yellow uniform gave it away. Um, <laughs> and then I sort of drifted. I did, also, I, I, did, I did all these sort of summer jobs, like I was an 1830 club rep at Pontins Blue Coat, and I worked in America on summer camps. But every Christmas I'd come back, or every winter, and stack shelves at Safeways. Yeah, well, that's how you saw the way through drama school, wasn't it? Was, was stacking shelves at Safeways at the night time. I'm interested in you being in the Navy, though. <laughs> I want to go back to that. You got, there was an incident on Snowden that Al told me about. <laughs> OK, so what happened was, I joined the Navy. Uh, uh, I wanted to be like Prince Andrew, uh, you know, because... I know. <laughs> I was from a council estate. My dad was a postman. Mum was a cleaner. I thought I wanted to be like Prince Andrew. I didn't realise it took billions of pounds worth of backing. Um, because he was this dashing helicopter pilot well, during yeah. the Falklands War. And I got a place at the Fleet Air Arm at Yeovilton. Uh, and the, the, the last thing they did was the medical. <laughs> uh, and they found out I was colourblind. So I could only... I, I wasn't allowed to kill anyone, basically. That's, that's what being colourblind in the forces means. You're not allowed to kill anyone. Is that because the British Army are only going to kill black people? And if you can't tell... <laughs> you can't tell the difference. <laughs> you I'm might so accidentally glad. kill a white person and then we'll be in trouble. I was so glad you said it. <laughs> I basically um, could be a stallsman, a steward, a cook, or a writer. A writer? A writer is a, <laughs> po po writer is a posh word for a pay accountant. Okay. A steward is a posh word for a waiter or a silver service waiter. Okay. Nothing wrong with any of these jobs. But I said to my friends, I was going in, so I thought, I'm going in. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I joined as a writer. But even, even then, I could see with computers coming in and faxes, that how many writers do you need these days? How many pay accounts do you need on a warship now? You know, you just fax, you know, you just send people's um, wages through on their phone. So the fax machines really had it in for you, didn't they, Sean? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> you pesky <laughs> fax. So basically, uh, I saw the writing on the wall and I was bored, uh, uh, witless, uh, to use the polite version of that phrase. And I lasted nine months and I got myself thrown out. But the trouble is, when you're over 18, you have to sign up for seven years. So the hard part is, how do you get yourself thrown out? So I looked it up in a book, you know, bedwetting, um, <laughs> being a member of, a, of, a, of an extremist organisation. You know what I mean? I, I should leave all this literature on my bed. No one, no one gave a damn, you know, uh, and all that. But anyway, so every top, the, the way to do it was you had to fail tests on purpose, right? Right. So I kept failing my last test that would have put me out into the fleet proper. This is, back, this is back to the Snowden story. So then I'd hang around for four weeks until the next class caught me up. And then I'd go through exactly the same thing with a different group of blokes I didn't even know. And then I'd fail the same test. Mm. So in the meantime, I boxed for the Navy. I boxed against the SAS at uh, Sterling Lines in Hereford, got battered. <laughs> um, honestly, I never even sparred. I just said, oh, I'm going to put in a box, so I got battered. Uh, uh, um, and another one was this climbing expedition to Snowden. But it wasn't Snowden, because Snowden, as we know, you can walk up. There's a restaurant at the top. There's something called the Pig Path you can walk up. It's called Triffin, which is next door and is honestly a harder climb, honestly. So we all walked up there. We were literally in T-shirts and flip-flops. Do you know what I mean? And we kept climbing up. There was about eight of us, led by a lieutenant. Um, we got right up, right up. And as you know, anyone who's climbed in those conditions, the snow came down. So we're stuck up there and we're stuffed, basically. We've gone up too far without the right bivouac gear. And one of my mates, Simon Jones, slipped and he fell down a mountain and just disappeared. The whole thing, right? And we thought he's dead. So we edged down to the edge and he's lying there with two broken legs. We didn't know he had broken legs. So we had to climb down to him. And then we kept trying to climb down, climb down, and we get stuck on a ledge that we, there's no way off of it. So we had to just huddle down for the night. And uh, we all got hypothermia and nearly died. It made news at 10, actually. <laughs> just after Reagan and Gorbachev in 1985, they said there's uh, 10 young naval cadets missing on, on Mount Tribune. So uh, uh, just before we died, I remember I was lying there thinking, Ugh. and this dog appeared on me, sort of, you know, slobbering all over me. I've never been so pleased to see a dog in my life. And it was the rescue dog. And uh, then we got airlifted by the RAF and we ended up, um, they saved our lives. Yeah. And you was that enough to get you kicked out of the Navy? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give a damn. They covered it up. It was on the front page of the local papers. They covered it up and said we had loads of gear. We didn't. And then um, <laughs> what happened in the end, I think I got my poor old late dad to phone up and say I was feeling suicidal, you know. So I just wanted it out of there, basically. So I left there and joined... 
Safeways as a shelf stack. <laughs> So you were, you were drinking a bit through your 20s and drifting around a bit. Ooh. Yeah. Who you been talking to? <laughs> my biggest ambition was to leave school and drink with my dad and his mates who were postmen. And the post office was a great job because um, you literally, all right, you'd have to get up at half four. That's the bummer. Guys, if you're thinking of being a postman, that's the bummer, right? I have to tell you that. But then you finish work at like half 12, so you'd be in the pub. Uh, 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 from half 12 to 2 and then I'd go home have a meal go back to bed and go out with my mates in the evening so at 16 I had the post office uniform so no one challenged my age I was on 10 pints a day at 16 which crept up to 12 a day at 17 and probably 14 a day at 18 yeah yeah <laughs> is where is this going because he's just sent me in the wings with a bottle of cider <laughs> so <laughs> he knows it hasn't gone away what? no seriously what, what, what got me away from that yeah. I mean I, I drank far too no, what, what was your question I well, I was going to ask you what, what, what made you turn around, because obviously you have turned things Drama around. school. Yeah. Yeah, because I realised it was my last chance, really, uh, because, um, yeah, I was literally going nowhere, and uh, uh, I was stacking shelves at Safeways, uh, uh, still living at home with my mum, overweight, uh, drinking too much. I was quite a catch, ladies, by the way. <laughs> and um, someone said to me, why don't you go down the local Amdram, because there's always lots of single ladies, because there is, uh, because, uh, uh, you know... It's always hard for them to get young men because they're very self-conscious. So I went down there and, yeah, it worked and uh, got a girlfriend and managed to get into drama school at the age of 27 called the Webber Douglas Academy, which no longer exists. Half my life no, no longer exists. I was a Pontins blue coat. doesn't <laughs> exist. The Isle of Wight camp doesn't exist. I was at the Mason Post Office. The site doesn't exist. I, I was... Uh, um, uh, uh, I went to Webber Douglas Academy. It doesn't exist. You be, want to be careful. yeah. You were replaced I'm, by a fax that no longer exists. I'm just warning you. <laughs> you st are still here, though. You still survive all of these things disappearing. So, so uh, what it was, when I, when I got the place at drama school, I thought, if you don't concentrate on this, you're stuffed. And I realised it was a great chance out of nowhere to really turn my life around. And for three years, I lasered in on acting. You know, you wouldn't think so if you look at me perform, but I did. <laughs> and uh, I lasered in on acting, and, and I gave up drinking for a good few months and uh, just went back to soap. Yeah, only, only about a week. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, I just lasered into it and just thought, this is it, otherwise you're going to end up on a park bench. And so I, you know, worked hard. And... But you must have been quite... Uh, my, uh, my friend went to Webber Douglas and he was quite a posh young student, you know, 21-year-old yeah. student. Did he, would, were you standing out? Did you make friends with the other actors there? Was it, was oh, it I, quite I, unusual? Have you ever seen the film Scum? I was like the Ray Winston. <laughs> <laughs> The Webber Douglas Academy. I, yeah. I, was the, I was the daddy of Chekhov wing. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I was the man. Um, Webber Douglas were great. It was run by a lovely guy called Rafe Jago, uh, uh, who was instrumental more than anyone of getting working class people into drama schools. So it was him and a few other people who really tried to found the grant system. Yeah. And I got half a grant under Thatcher. You know, I mean, this, was, this was quite an achievement. Uh, uh, and yeah, great. I was so grateful. And my mum and dad stumped up the rest until I could pay them back. Uh, and um, I was so lucky to be able to go. But Webber Douglas were great. That They had a great age range of 18 year olds right through to 30. I wasn't even the youngest, um, oldest person on the course. Uh, there were people in 30, 31. Yeah. So it was great. Yeah. yeah. A lot of EastEnders actors came from Webber D. Uh, Leslie Grantham, Anita Dobson, Ross Kemp, because the founders, Julia Smith and Tony Holland, went to Webber D. So they remembered all these lovely actors when they first uh, uh, put EastEnders on and they kept employing Webber D actors, yeah. Cool. And, and so, I guess, I mean, East, EastEnders came quite... I mean, obviously, it was your first job. How, how long before then the return with the... So what happened was, I, I got the job as the paramedic... And then I got the obligatory job in the bill, which is such a shame it's gone. It was such a great hire of actors. And uh, I did um, uh, Inspector Morse with John Thor, which was wonderful. Uh, Waiting for God with Stephanie Cole and Graham Crowden. And then the part of Barry came up to my agent and said, right, now you've got the uh, audition for a part of Barry. So I went up, met the casting lady, Jane Deach. And she uh, sat outside her and she said, here's the casting brief. Tells you everything you need to know about the character, age, history, everything. So I'm sat out in this corridor, and it says, Barry Evans is a big, good-looking blonde fella. His friends call him Golden Boy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I stuck my head back around the corner of the office and went, thanks very much for the wind-up. I'm off. But she said, no, the actor who was going to play Roy, Tony Selby, who's best known in Get Some In as the sadistic uh, 
yeah. uh, lieutenant in his, his old show in the 70s. He's done loads of stuff, Tony, but he was cast as, as, as Roy Evans and he pulled out. So then they cast a guy called Tony Corner, who looked more like my dad than my own dad. And I got the part purely because Tony Corner, or I looked like him. We looked like each other because right. he was a well-known character actor. So, you know, it's a weird business. It's sort of, you know, you, your fate is always decided, especially in the early days, by someone else, you know, and... Uh, yeah, I got the job purely because I looked like Tony Corner. And, and even then, in the early days, it wasn't like I was supposed to be a, a permanent fixture in fitting. I mean, I was signed up for four episodes. And then I, I was sitting at home. Then I did one, and then I did three. The really, Barry was just there to get Roy in to marry Pat. And they tried to make me a hard man, which I'm not. You know, if you want that, you get Ray Winston. So I, I gave Cindy the number of the hitman that shot Ian Beale. If you're under 30, talk amongst yourself. Um, <laughs> I, I set fire to the car lot to try and get rid of the Mike Reed character, okay. uh, Frank, and Phil Mitchell was in one of his alcoholic phases and was sleeping in there, so I nearly barbecued Phil Mitchell. <laughs> I was that close, folks. I was that close. <laughs> so, um, basically, I had to have my comeuppance. So, uh, Barry went to prison, and I said, am I coming back? They said, we're not sure. So then, I spent six months... Um, really not knowing what I was going to do, whether they wanted me back. I got the occasional job, but I remember going to... Because everyone knew me by this time. You know, so I remember going to the cash point and people were going, Barry, flash the cash, you must be minted. And it would say, card refused. <laughs> Honestly, there's nothing worse than being famous in skin, trust me. Uh, you know, so, so that was it. So I wasn't sure. And then eventually they, they gave me the chance to go back. But in the meantime, the reason why I got into cabaret was a friend of mine who ran something called the uh, uh, casino rooms in Rochester. Anyone remember the casino rooms? Aaron and Paul Stone, as a few veterans out there <laughs> of the casino rooms, they were messy nights, they were. And he said, do you want to come along and be a compere? So I said, what does that mean? He said, well, you can come along, you bring on the support act, you go out, you sing a song, tell a few jokes, bring on the support act, take them off again, everyone eats their chicken and chips in a basket. <laughs> um, and then you come out, sing a song, tell a few jokes, ladies and gentlemen, and bring on the support act, uh, the, the, the uh, lead act. So that's what I did for, for weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, Freddie Starr, Jim Davidson, uh, The Drifters, David Essex. So I'd even forgot to ask them who was going to be on the following week. So I turned up on Friday night. I said, who is it tonight? They said, it's your mate, Mike Reed. I went, all oh, right. I hadn't seen him for months. So he was late. He got stuck in traffic in the Dartford Tunnel or whatever. So I went on, sung my song, told a few jokes. Ladies and gentlemen, coffee and cream, the support act, whatever, you know. So I said, where's Mike? They said, he's not here. I went, oh. So they said, you've got to go out now. This is where you earn your money. You've got to just keep going, keep going until he gets here. I'm like, Ugh. So I didn't know any, many jokes. So I sang a song, told a few jokes, sang a song, kept going. They went, he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Reed. So I'm in the dressing room, uh, full of relief. And Mike, at the time, whether you, uh, you know, were a fan or not, he was rocking. So everyone was rocking, hanging off the ceilings, loving Mike Reed. Until he started to tell a joke I'd told in the warm-up. <laughs> so he'd gone from that to tumbleweed. And he went, so this is a really bad impression, hang on. <laughs> Nerdy. <laughs> Nerdy. Either that joke's become pony overnight, or my mate's beaten me to it. And they went, yeah, Barry told it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he ain't my mate no more then, is he? <laughs> He picked it up again. He had a meeting out the palm of his hand until he started telling another joke. I told him. <laughs> That's when I remember where I got all my jokes from, listening to Mike Reed and the Queen Vic. <laughs> so he came off stage and I hid in a broom cupboard, right? Because he was a big bloke. <laughs> and uh, I heard him put his jacket on and he walked past the cupboard and he went, I'll see you back at work, joke thief. <laughs> I thought he'd have forgotten about it. When I went back three months later, he hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> and they changed Barry quite a lot, though, didn't they? From this, so he was the hard man, and then suddenly became... A the... lovely actor called Paul Bradley. Remember Nigel with the big flowery shirts and the kipper ties? They don't. They're all Vic Reeves fans. Um... It's not until next week. Oh, we sorry. <laughs> There was a character called Nigel who wore bright Hawaiian shirts and kipper ties. Paul Bradley, lovely fellow, ended up in Holby. So he was the resident fat funny man, you know? And then he left and they decided they needed a fat funny man. So they sort of 
the bottomized Barry and shifted him over to that role. They did. Yeah. You know, she went from burning down the car lot to, oh, there's a banana skin, I think I'll slip on that. <laughs> yeah. But it gave me a longevity, you know, yeah. so I was in it for another sort of eight years. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, that becoming, when you're that, I mean, this is what has subsequently you've used your advantage as well, but you become so associated with a character like Barry when you have that success, it's that double-edged sword, that you've got this massively successful character, but if you want to move away or move on, that people will, like, so, you know, do associate you, the yeah. person, with the character. I think what the problem was at the time, do you remember when there was only four TV channels? Do you remember when you had to watch Top of the Pops with your dad? <laughs> <laughs> Who's this idiot? It's Boy George, Dad. What was it, a bloke or a brass? What is it? You remember that? <laughs> it was great fun, wasn't it? So people had to watch the same thing. They had, we had this, you know... So the, there was only four channels. You get 20 million people on a Tuesday night yeah. when there wasn't a murder. <laughs> Seriously, do you know what I mean? It was, it was extraordinary. Uh, um, so you just became famous, you know. It was irrelevant whether you were talented or not. You just became famous. You know, I mean, nowadays we've got... Do you know what really brought it home to me, how big EastEnders used to be, right? Do you remember when Prince Harry got married a couple of years ago? Yeah? Did anyone watch it? Four people will own up to that. <laughs> The next day, the papers were full of it. 18 million viewers. You know, great. Unbelievable, isn't it? 18 million viewers. This is how big EastEnders used to be. Prince Harry's wedding, 18 million viewers. Fat Barry's wedding, 20 million viewers! <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's extraordinary. Yeah. You know, but there are so many more leisure options now. You yeah. don't have to tune in to the BBC or ITV. You don't have to. And, and that's, that's why it, it hangs about, because I read somewhere, I hope it's not true, but the other day they got 2.4 million people for an episode, you know, because people don't have to tune into it. No, I think that's so true. You, you're just famous by association. Yeah. You know? But is, is it because it's a soap opera or because it's in your home every day? You know, you see other actors and you don't necessarily think, oh, that actor is the person. You know, I think with you, it feels like people feel, and wrongly so, because you're not like Barry. I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think what it is, I think when it comes to a soap actor, you see them do their shtick so many times, like a busy soap actor will break down crying three times a year. Do you know what I'm getting at? Whereas if you're a film actor or you're in a successful series, you look at that standalone performance of them having a breakdown and you think that's brilliant. But when someone like Ian Bill's done it for the 36th time, <laughs> you not only get tired of it, you get inured in a way to their talent. I'm being deadly yeah, yeah. serious because you, you just see them do their thing all the time. So I think it is recognised as a sort of secondary form of... Do you know what I'm getting at? I do. Well, we had the guys from uh, Emmerdale on, uh, Dominic and... Let's just call Mar Marlon Dominic and Paddy. Let's yeah, call him by that. Let's call him by that. Marlon and Paddy's good enough, yeah. They were brilliant. I mean... You probably, I don't know if you watch Emmerdale, there was a, 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 a storyline with Paddy and Chaz and the baby. They lost the baby. Pfft, I'm telling you, it's as good as anything you'll ever see. Yeah. But because people just saw it, and then there was the big follow-up to it, and now she's pregnant again, it's not regarded on the same level as, I don't know, a Benedict Cumberbatch breakdown or something. Do you know what I'm getting? I do, and, but you, know, and you guys are working so hard. I mean, it's, any of those, any acting job is a lot of waiting around and a lot of you know, do, learning your lines, doing that stuff, but you're not even really waiting around that much because you're in there with the next episode, the next episode you're working Well, they're constantly. making a movie a week. I mean, I think yeah. Corey or Emmerdale, they have five a week. So they're making a movie a week, so sometimes the standard is bound to fluctuate. But back to your point, what happened was, I don't want to bore you if, if you're a non-soap fan, because you've got Vic Reeves coming up, they can edit that out. Uh, um, <laughs> what they do is... What happened was, years ago, do you remember when there was only two episodes a week? And I think it was Tuesday and Thursday. Then they brought in a Monday night episode, uh, episode so that, that was three. Then they brought in a Friday, it was four a week. When there was only two, you'd go in the day before and you'd rehearse it like a play. Right. So there'd be all the marks on the floor, like, and the cameraman would be wandering around doing all that sort of thing. And So when you went on set the next day, it took less time to produce this. Then it went to three a week, and there was a few uh, rehearsals. Then it went to four a week, forget it. You sort of on set, they said, we'll film the rehearsal. If it's any good, we'll take it. You know, yeah. being deadly serious. Because they, they film what's called multi-camera. I won't bore you. But if you're watching a movie, a Tom Cruise film, everything, they'll film his close-up. Then they'll film his mid... 
They have Sandman on the soaps as well. <laughs> <laughs> they'll film his close up, I'll use a different hand to pull the thing away from me. Then they'll film his mid shot, then they'll film a long shot, and it's meticulous. If the close up isn't good enough, they'll do it again, again, again. Multi camera means you've got four cameras on you all time, so they're getting it in one take. So if, if, if it's half decent, they'll take it. Um, so, as a result, it's just filmed so much quicker. Uh, I've known actors, I've met actors in makeup, sort of saying, I've always wanted to be on EastEnders. They're the brewery manager from Luxford and Copley, you know. Every year there's a brewery manager from Luxford, always a different actor who comes in and gives the landlord a hard time. And he was like, oh, I can't wait, I've always wanted to be in EastEnders. He's one episode, the poor bloke. So he's gone on set, they've taped his rehearsal, he's back in his car within 20 minutes. <laughs> And that was his EastEnders experience, but they just haven't got time. So the least you are when you leave is efficient. I'm not saying that's a great thing to, be, <laughs> to appertain to, but, you know, uh, 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 you know, but the least you are when you leave is efficient. Yeah, but not everyone becomes a beloved character. Even people who are in it for a long time, you know, there's people who you wouldn't remember from 20 years ago in EastEnders. If they walked into the room, you, wouldn't, you might go, oh... But you know what I mean, the, the, the Barry character really resonated. I think I was lucky. I was given a lot of the comedy. It, 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 it's always been the more serious one uh, again if, if you don't watch them but if you watch Coronation Street and Emmerdale they've always done comedy very well Coronation Street has always done double acts very well uh, uh, EastEnders has always been quite hard hitting and in fairness they, they, they've always sort of gone out of their way to tackle issues but uh, that can also be a bit heavy so when you're given all the comedy yeah you're more memorable and myself Doc Cotton or whoever you know uh, uh, were given the comedy and for some reason, you know, it's... it's I mean, I've changed my passport now, so it's, uh, it's just easier. Because <laughs> if you're in Miami, you know, you know how hard they are in America or New York, someone shouts out, Barry! Hang on a second, it says here his name is Sean Williams. <laughs> Do you know what? Michael Caine has just changed his passport. <laughs> right. At the age of 80-odd to Morris... From Morris Micklewhite to Michael Caine. Right. <laughs> Because he's known even in Thailand, and people go, Maurice Micklewhite, Maurice Micklewhite. And they always drag him in the back room. So he changed his passport in his late 70s. I think. <laughs> Just given, finally, he's had too much. But it, so was it? I mean, I think you talk very uh, on, honestly and openly about your career, and I, I think that's very admirable. And it's, it's, you know, you leave EastEnders, you've made that decision to go, really. It was sort of your decision, was it? It was, yeah. I, I gave up EastEnders to appear on this very stage. Um, in a pantomime for Kevin Wood. Thank God it wasn't for this, because you'd have been waiting a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a few bits and pieces in between. Not, not, not many. Uh, um, because it, back in the day, they didn't just let people flounce off to do the jungle or strictly come dancing. And because I'd gone straight into the show from drama school, it was all I'd done. By the time I was 40, I'd spent a quarter of my life in EastEnders. So I was desperate to do anything else. And I was trying to get some time off, they wouldn't give it to me. Uh, the storyline with Janine, which we'll go on to, I'm sure, later. I was supposed to find out. But basically, I was married to a character called Janine. She ended up pushing me off a cliff in Scotland <laughs> on New Year's Day. We got married on New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> That's an expensive shag, that is, I tell you. Uh, uh, Pushed off a cliff in Scotland. At the time, there was a bit of controversy. Did he fall? Was he pushed? Did she mean to just push me away from her and I tumbled back and fell off on my own accord? Or did she mean to push me? Who thinks I just tripped and fell over my own feet? Who thinks she meant to push me? Yes. Who literally couldn't care less? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but what happened was I'd found out the writers were going to write me to have a passionate love affair with Pat Butcher. <laughs> so I jumped. <laughs> But this, then it's difficult to leave that. So, and, and, and Dots, you did like, you've worked all the way through. So, you, all this self deprecating stuff isn't true. You've worked all the time. I think you like, you've, you've taken a lot of things that have been offered to you. Maybe it's I've got an answer for measures that says I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was interested in um, quite early on, I think you did a show called Gender Swap, okay. which I don't think you could do this show anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But I'm prepared to have you talk about it. <laughs> so what happened was... They did a show that featured, obviously, prosthetics. And I was going to become a woman and Carol Smiley was going to become a man. Luckily, I don't think there's much evidence. It was just before everything stayed online forever. Do you know what I mean? Right. Thank God. <laughs> 
so they basically did these prosthetics, prosthetics, and I didn't look much different. <laughs> it wasn't that good, to be honest. So I was always so self-conscious that I didn't really do a very good acting job. Carol Smiley looked like a, a wolf man. <laughs> they gave her like a little beard and a, a moustache. So the first thing I had to do was go and make some purchases from Brent Cross Shopping Centre, so that was all right. The second thing I had to do was, I used to be a member of a quiz team for the Unicorn B quiz team just over the railway bridge, uh, uh, the railway crossing. And I had to go and interview my quiz team dressed as this woman about the phenomenon of quizzing, which they very politely went along with for about 10 minutes until one said, just piss off back to Panto. <laughs> <laughs> And then the third thing I had to do was go speed dating at a branch of Tiger Tiger in Hammersmith. And I had to go around 10 different guys every three minutes and it was the longest half an hour of my life. Although one of the guys did put in afterwards that he wanted to keep in touch. <laughs> so we do. What was... <laughs> <laughs> what was the purpose of this show though? Really just a... Is it prank show? Is it? <laughs> to put 20 grand in my bank. <laughs> I, I have done some old crap, I must admit. But, you know, everyone has to do that, some of those things. And, well, like, like me, uh, but unlike me, in some ways, you're very into quizzing, as you've said there, and you've, yeah. you've done a lot of the TV quiz shows. You've, done, you've been on Pointless, you've done okay. Uh, <laughs> I think you and I are probably the top two players ever on Pointless. How did you get on? I don't, I don't like to brag about it, so I don't really talk about it. Um, I got knocked out in the first round with 200 points the first time I went on. You, you got the highest ever, the, 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 the highest number of pointless answers in the a, a so, quiz yeah, ever? I've won it four yeah. times. Yeah, yeah okay. Can I, can I have one of your trophies? <laughs> I've been on three times. Haven't won it. But the thing is, without no false modesty, the thing is, most celebs, or whatever you want to call them, they're so immersed in their career. They're not worried about what's the smallest, you know, country on the African mainland, are they? Do you know what I mean? They're not bothered. It's the Gambia, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, they're not bothered. It's just that I'm so sad that I just, I, it's my hobby and I want to win. So I've managed to win. I won the jackpot three times and, and won where I couldn't get a Celine Dion pointless answer. Uh -huh. uh, um, and Mastermind and The Chase and Eggheads. How did you do on Mastermind? Yeah, we won them all, yeah. How many, point, how many points did you get on Mastermind? Uh, uh, do you know what? Mastermind was great because I was, my, my, my specialist subject was Richard Burton, the Welsh actor. And um, there was myself, Anthony Warren Thompson, the chef, Jeremy Bowen, the war correspondent. And then there was an empty seat on the end. Anyway, so I get talking to, J Jeremy, um, to Anthony Warren Thompson and he said, I'm Richard Burton's godson. Because his dad was at the RSC in the 50s. I went, well, that's a good omen. And we said, who's on the end? And they went, you'll find out later. So just before the show starts, the door opens, in comes a blonde Labrador followed by David Blunkett and two huge security men. So he sat off to my left, he was a charming man. But I had to help him to the seat because there's a big drop in front of the chair before you go over to John Humphreys. And I was more nervous about that than the bloody quiz, really. <laughs> uh, and what was uh, um, his subject, David Blunkett's subject? Harry Potter. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so basically, I managed to get 17 out of 17 on Burton and then I, I hang on for grim death on general knowledge and just edged home, yeah. Okay. I got 35 points and came second. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah. Who did you lose to? Stephen Fry? Uh, Hillary, Hillary Kay. She did antiques. It's not like, well, uh, I've never talked to her. I don't, I've never talked to her. I might have been 34. I, I had the highest ever score for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, so, when you've, what other ones have you been? There was something else I wanted to talk to, not one of the other ones. Well, you've I'm, been I'm on. writing a book. Yes about my year in quizzing. So yeah. it started with the World Championships last month and it ends next June. Uh, so it's, it's my year in the life of quizzing. So, um, yeah, and it's autobiographical. And at the end of each chapter, there's a series of questions from that night and the, the answers at the back of the book. So it's a quiz book as well. So. I mean, it's good because, again, people would assume that Barry couldn't do quizzes. So that's, that's a, there's a... <laughs> correctly, I think, isn't it? So is that, is that your secret weapon? In... I think so, yeah. It, you know... People don't expect too much of me <laughs> in anything, <laughs> you know. But you're, so. you're a multi-talented, you genuinely are a multi-talented man. You're a fantastic singer, 
Um, you can do, you know, you, you can do the lot. So that's, it's, it's you certainly know, jack of all trades, I'm afraid. But yeah, well, it's, it's right. disingenuous. I think you know you and and it, what's impressive, and you know, I've had this with a lot of people. Your career is already a very long career, and you you're a young-ish man. <laughs> um, and uh, you try you know, telling and me it's, knees. And it's still, you know, you're still. This is hair dye. Still, <laughs> you're still working, so it's all it's all very important. Again, you know, it, no, it's I'm being serious. It's being jack of all trades and not. To be honest, I, I wouldn't do gender swap again. I'm being deadly serious, but you know, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't. But God, my legs are shot now, anyway. But, uh, um, but you know, I'd still. If I think I'm going to have fun, it's like this Friday. Something comes out called Five Go Barging. So it's myself, Lord John Prescott. Just before he had a stroke, bless him. I wish him all the luck in the world. Apparently, he's doing very well. Um, uh, Michael Burke, the newsreader, war correspondent. Uh, Amanda Barry and uh, Anita Harris. I was the youngest person by 19 years. <laughs> this is the youngest I've been on a job since Waiting for God in 1994. <laughs> uh, but I thought, you know what, I'd do it, because I, I had the best time. We had two weeks on a barge, and, you know, they were very generous with the fridge. Uh, well, honestly, I've had, I had such a laugh. We got up Macclesfield, uh, Staffordshire Canal, and then the Grand Union. Yeah. So I'm not going to turn down something like that. The problem is, you know, every time you do this, your dream of playing Uncle Vanya is receding into the mist. <laughs> but, you know, A, I can't sit still and wait for that, and B, it's just a life experience. It's a laugh, do you know what I mean? And you meet different people, and you go places you wouldn't otherwise do, and I just enjoy it. And but that's it, I think. But and We had Les Dennis on, and we'll talk about extras in a second, but it's, but it's the same, you know, you can say the same about Les. Les had his ups and downs. Les did a lot of those sort of shows. And then I think both of you, the, to choosing to, you know, being chosen and choosing to do the extras. And as you know, Les has just joined the Royal Shakespeare exactly, Company. Yeah. So, you know, it, ha it happens. So that phone call can come. I did work for the National Theatre in a show called One Man, Two Governors. So it can happen. It's just, but you realise every time you go on telly and dress up as a chicken, <laughs> you know, you, you're doing it to yourself. You've, 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 you've got no excuse. Here you go. I didn't make no, uh, <laughs> um, you've got no excuses it's, it's no one else's fault that you're typecast you do it to yourself but A you've got to pay the bills and B you've got to have fun but both of you so with, and all of you in extras and Keith as well you all kind of owned what the, the stereotype was and I don't know how much Ricky and Steve Merchant had sort of decided whether they were, thought they were taking the piss or whether they were yeah. joining in with the joke but, but by owning it then you took real, real control of it, I think. I, I think you're right. I mean, I was in my garden one day and my, my ex-wife ran out and said, Ricky Gervais is on the phone. I said, tell him to piss off. Because I said, it's going to be Steve Penk. Do you remember Steve? Yeah. He used to do radio wind-ups. Do you know what I mean? He'd <laughs> pretend to be someone. In fact, was it Steve or someone else? Got through to Tony Blair? Yeah, pretending I, think, to be I don't know who it was, but yeah. Someone else? Yeah. Alistair, Alistair, whatever, unbelievable. But he said, no, it's him. So he said, do you want to be in my new show? Extras. I said, I'd love to. What's the name of my character? Barry from East End. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know you're typecast and it's totally different bloody show playing the same character. I mean, I phoned home once, my daughter picked the phone up, I said, hi, love, it's Daddy. She said, who? I said, it's Daddy. She said, who? I said, it's Barry from East End. She said, why didn't you say so? I'll go and get Mum. Uh, so he said to me, look, everyone's... Apparently, he gets hold of the actor's numbers and he gets hold of you before your agent, so you, your agent's got no bargaining power. He's not silly. So he said, look, he said, you're going to get the mickey taken out of you, but we all are. And he said, he said, we've got Kate Winslet as a nun and Ben Stiller as a really horrible verse. I said, well, look, if these people are doing it, I'd love to. So the first series, I was just in the office, really, with Stephen Merchant um, playing his... If you've never seen it, I'm playing a comic version of Sean Williamson, but I'm uh, Stephen Merchant, who's an agent called Darren Lamb. I'm his assistant, and he just calls me Barry. So I never get any work apart from doing a bit of artexing around his flat and I'm sleeping rough in a car. So that's the basis, basis of extras. But then in the second series, so I was only in about eight scenes, but the second series dropped on the mat. I worked with David Bowie. Um, I ended up with a very naughty pen. If you, what, with the, the ladies' clothes come off. That was my pen. And Stephen Merchant pleasured himself while looking at this pen. <laughs> But my pen ended up with Robert De Niro. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to, you know, and it was great fun. And then they put me in a show called Life's Too Short, which wasn't as successful because it was, it, was, it was just a show about Warwick Davis being short. But it was brilliant. I mean, they milked it for six episodes in an Easter special. 
every, every dwarf gag you can think of was in there. And it was lovely. And in the Easter special, Warwick Davis took over the careers of me, Keith Chegwin and Les Dennis and took us out on the road as a cabaret group. Um, and honestly, it's as much fun as you can have while keeping your clothes on, honestly. It was, it was, it was so much fun. And Les said he'd made up quite a few lines. They let you ad-lib and you, you did quite a lot of ad-libs. If you could think of a funnier line than they gave you, you could ad-lib, uh, which, which wasn't that often because they're brilliant. But yeah. I, I caught them out now and again. There was a scene with a muffin uh, and that made them laugh and they had to reshoot it a few times. You know... It, they were well up for you ad-libbing, but, yeah. you know, obviously a lot of the time you can't come up with anything better than their scripts. Sure. So, but it, that, that was, that was a, obviously a huge turning point for you in, in terms of... Well, it was. It wasn't in the term of being typecast as Barry from EastEnders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which only sort of got worse. But to me, what I think happened was... The latest crop of writers and directors who were at uni at the time that worshipped Ricky and Stephen are now out and about doing it. Yeah. So I do get work from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. They all say we're massive fans of extras and life's too short. So I do get work from that. You know? Yeah. How was it being your, the manager for you, though? So I, I, was, I was dealing with your manager and he said, please don't call him Barry from EastEnders. He doesn't mind, but please don't do it. Please call him Sean. It's one of them things. There's nothing you can do. You know, all you, got, all you can do is go with the flow. Uh, um, so every, every, anybody over 40, it's Barry. Anybody under 40 or 30, it's normally Ricky Gervais. Uh, anybody at the, uh, the age of 18, it's a children's series called Scoop. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, so I can now get on a train when a load of school children get on and be unmolested, which is great, I can't tell you. Uh, so... As it goes on, I didn't mean. Uh, come on, back to Prince Andrew. Come on. We're better than that. <laughs> I'm so sad those days have gone. Uh, uh, verbally unmolested, uh, you know. So it's, it's just that thing where, as it goes on, you know, it's like you know, it was it was one of the, the first soaps to really give uh, uh, Asian and, and black families great storylines. So whenever you're yeah. in London now, it's deadly serious. A lot of Asian and, and black people over forty. It's always, but you know. Everywhere you go, you know, Barry, you know, so it, it, it's just not going to go away. No. Um, I'm going to ask you some emergency questions. Do you think uh, Barry from EastEnders ever tried to suck his own cock? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? There was, such, there was an even bigger gut there at the time. So <laughs> it's not going to happen, because let's face it, if it could, I mean, you, you, you know, you wouldn't get married, you wouldn't go out, would you, really? <laughs> Just stay in with a bottle of cider. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'm going to ask you some emergency questions, because uh, people will want to hear them. I bet they do. Um, <laughs> if that's a taster, I didn't mean that as a... I'll go in... Uh, <laughs> good choice of words. Um, I will go early, because we're out... You know, we're not in London now. These people... Yes, but it will end They're up, less sophisticated it will end up on the people. radio, though, you know. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll ask you this, which I think I've got the answer, because we did briefly talk about this backstage. Have you ever seen a ghost? <laughs> OK, so I did Big Brother, uh, um, obviously for artistic reasons. <laughs> uh, I did Big Brother because I, I had a, a long phone call with someone who I've grown very close to uh, uh, over, the, over the years, and the conversation went something like this. HMRC, have you got the money? Me, no. <laughs> HMRC, then we'd like your house. Me, well, give me two weeks. <laughs> and I was in there with lovely Derek Akora. So, no, but they were a very successful man, by the way, but they were obsessed in the diary room with me. Look, Derek's a fake, isn't he? Derek's a fake. And I said, I believe Derek feels and sees everything he believes he sees and feels. It's as simple as that. So, Derek phoned me up. We moved into a new house. My, myself, my current wife, lovely Adele. Uh, we moved into a new house, and straight away there was like banging up, you know what I mean? Banging noises, banging noises. I, I, mean, I mean of boxes being, I don't mean the other way. So um, we did, we got a ghost. And Derek phoned me up because he wanted me to be on his radio show, and he went, Rosemary. I went, right, okay. Rosemary's the name of the lady who lives in your house. Because you know what it's like, if you're a man, you know, you've you got a teddy bear or, you know, you, you call everything by a male, it's just habit, isn't it? You know, when you've got a doll as a kid or a, a teddy bear, it's always got a male name. And girls call their bears or whatever a female name. So I was always like, whatever I called him, Dennis, shut up! I'm trying to work! Or whatever, He's, it's Rosemary. 
So basically, yes, we have got a, a, a noisy ghost in our house, and according to Derek, it's called Rosemary. Right. So I can't really... I do believe the spirits of people linger where they were, yeah. and all the time there's evidence of poltergeist and they get a bit more leery, uh, I assume there must be. She's just banging about the Rosemary. <laughs> well, it's early days. <laughs> Have you ever seen anything that you can't explain? No, it's just noises. It's just noises. noises. She's, a, she's a real banger. She is. <laughs> there might just be a monkey trapped in the walls or something. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, it, 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 we've been in there for two years, so it, it, to survive, he'd have to be able to suck his own cock because <laughs> we haven't fed him. Was that... That's how, Self must, that must run out eventually. Must, <laughs> must run out. Of you that. started it. Ends <laughs> with a monkey. I'm gonna. I've, where are they? I've got some new ones at the back of this book. But I think, I'm interested in this. This is an interesting question. When was the last time you were on a coach? Travelled by coach. <laughs> Ooh. That shattered my uh, image as man of the. <laughs> yes. Not even bus on a coach. Who would and a coach to do it? They didn't have to. But it's not like I'm chauffeured everywhere. Uh, who just goes on a coach? What a brilliant question. That is a brilliant question. Because I can only think, I mean, I, I, I was probably in my 20s, definitely in my 20s when I was last on a coach, but I don't think I've. I think been it on a must coach. have been a, a, a Greyhound bus from Atlanta ah. to New Orleans in about 1989. You're doing Camp America at the Boone I did Camp America, and afterwards, we, Camp America is a summer camp in America. Uh, 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 and afterwards you get six weeks on, on your visa. You can do what you want as long as you're back at JFK at a certain date. So myself and a guy met on the camp. We hitchhiked. We did all that. We followed Jack Kerouac's route down to New Orleans and on the road. Uh, slept in tennis courts and people's back gardens, and, and we, 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 it was rough. <laughs> uh, we got picked up by a, a, a guy who seemed to be very nice. <laughs> And at the time, we were in shorts, Union Jack shorts, and I was reasonably fit at the time, ladies, honestly. And um, obviously, uh, uh, we got picked up by this guy, and I was sitting behind the driver, and my mate Andy was in the front, and I was dozing off, and I got, I could hear him go, <laughs> but what the hell's he doing? Because this guy was getting a bit grabby. Yeah. So. So we started off really lovely. I was talking about, uh, I've been to Oxford, I've been here. He's, he's like Boss Hogg in Dukes, hasn't he? <laughs> I've been to Oxford. And then uh, after a while, he's like getting really silly. He's like, you want your dick, sir? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm all right, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were, uh... <laughs> I think we're all right, even though I can't do it myself. <laughs> So I travelled with a set of darts and I got them out of my rucksack and I'm like, I'm going to do them in his juggler, you know. And uh, but in the end, he let us out and then he just, at three in the morning, he just drove around this roundabout screaming abuse at us. So we got a Greyhound bus from Atlanta. <laughs> yes. We never quite made the last, uh, the last third of it, really. But, it's yeah. amazing when, uh, you know, like, and you've got uh, grown-up kids now, have you? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember, you know, I was going hitchhiking when I was 18 and getting into those sort of scrapes. Mm. Uh, Vic Reeves, who's on next week, had hitchhiked and was picked up by Fred and Rosemary West, is what we discovered last time he was yes. on the show. Yeah. And then I think he thought he was a girl and then let him go when he realised he wasn't a girl. Um, no, it, it was ama it's it amazing. Terrifying. It's amazing how we were just let to do all those things and everyone who travelled will have stories like that. Well, this is the thing. My son's just come back from Camp America, Joe. He literally just come back before he starts his apprenticeship. And um, when you think back in the day, I phoned my parents once every fortnight. In fact, I did it once drunk and got them up at four in the morning because I forgot about the time <laughs> difference. They loved that. They had loved me for two weeks. I was like, is there, a pro is, is, is there anything important? I went, no. And they went, well, sod off. <laughs> but, you know, with Joe, I'd send him a text. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's that, it, it, it's that inst instantaneous. Although I do think the world has become a more dangerous place, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think, but it, must, it was as dangerous. So we just didn't really know... I mean, it's become dangerous in different ways, but it clearly was as dangerous, you know, you're sending... I mean, when I look at... When you see kids in their late teens now, you kind of think, God, they're just children. How could, how could you have children and let them go? Yeah, I mean, you have to, obviously, but you it's... You say it was dangerous, or I got picked up by people who were willing to suck my cock. That's nice. <laughs> Surely that's nice. It's better but than... But it, it's, you know, you can't play the British... Forgive me, you can't play the British card like you used to be able to. Do you know what I mean? Right. Well, you're from England, because it's got the web and everything, you know what I mean? And Netflix yeah. and Sky Atlantic, forget all that, unless you end up in 
you know, Hooverville, Indiana, population 100. You can't play that trump card anymore, so, yeah. you know. Is trump card the right word? Yeah, no, I don't, America, know. Don't, <laughs> don't play the trump card. <laughs> um, look, it's been lovely talking to you. We're going to have to wrap up in a second, but we will ask you about something else first. You've been doing some writing as well. Yeah, I've got a literary agent. Uh, um, uh, uh, I've, I've written a couple of... I'm not successful at the moment. I've written a couple of episodes of an Irish soap called Red Rock. Uh, I've done numerous training films. I've come so close a couple of times to cracking the big one. I wrote about uh, a story about hot pickers who come down from London to Kent uh, on, on the day war breaks out. That got serialised by Radio uh, Kent called Eden's End. Uh, but I'd like to take it to BBC Four and brush that up a bit. But it was, it was great to, for that to happen. It was, it was incredible. Uh, um, so, yeah, I like anyone, they just plug away and, and, and hope for the biggie, really. Yeah. Um, well, did, this is Jade One Hit Wonder. Was that was that, was that uh... Jade One Hit Wonder was made by uh, uh, it, it was my script and it was an idea for a film based on a friend of mine called Mark Noyce, who's a, a filmmaker. But that that hasn't really got out of the starting blocks yet. Right. Uh, but um, you know what it's like on IM. There's something called IMDb. I'm sure you all know this, yeah. right? International Movie Database. Yeah. You've only got to say yes to some aspiring filmmaker. Yeah, you can put me attach me to it, and it's on there. Sure. IMDb. There's loads of films that are, you know on there that. Uh, that will never see the light of day. But, yeah, uh, it's, it's difficult, you know, in British films as well, it's so difficult, they get made and no one sees them, or they get made and they disappear, and straight to video or whatever, straight to DVD, or download that would be, but... Um... But in the same way, there's never been a better time to get one out. It might be a flop, but at least you can probably get it made and out there on some cable channel, you know, as opposed to yeah. trying to approach ITV or BBC or... The, the financial rewards aren't as great, but at least... There's never been a better time to get one out, whether, even when, if it's on your phone and you share it, you know, yeah. as an example of your work, so... And talking of getting one out, you were going to be in a carry-on film. <laughs> right, what happened very quickly? <laughs> they were going to relaunch the Carry On brand. It was going to be called, called Carry On England. You got the facts. London. London. Carry On London. So I went to the launch. Uh, uh, I had to go and see Peter Rogers, who is the legendary producer of the Carry On films. So uh, I, I went to see him at his office at Elstree Studios. Uh, um... Pinewood, Pinewood, forgive me. And uh, the producer was very keen that I met Peter because his word still meant everything. So uh, I walked into his office and this great big German shepherd rose up to meet me. And I, I was all over this German shepherd and I, I had one called Jack and I went, I've got one of them, so he loved me straight away. So he said, I'd like you to be in the film. I went, that's fantastic. And then he invited me to eat with him in the restaurant. And at the end, Peter used to finish his meal and he climbed to the top of the stairs and he'd turn around and he'd wave to everybody whether they were looking at him or not. <laughs> and he'd walk off, and he turned around, and he slipped on a bit of asparagus. <laughs> I thought, don't die yet, for God's sake. <laughs> I mean, so we, we, we did a launch. We were guests of Stephen Norris MP at the House of Commons uh, to launch, and, and my character was called Dickie Ticker. <laughs> and I signed autographs as Dickie Ticker, and then it never got made. <laughs> I mean, you'd be, you'd be perfect for Carry On. Yeah, you which, think? Kind of, which sort of character, the sort of Kenneth Connor or... Yeah, Peter, yeah. Peter, what was his name? Butterfield. Who was, who was married to Faith Brown? Yeah. He's one of the bumbling sort of characters, isn't it? Yeah. You could be, no, I think I can see you at the I'm not going to be Jim I, Dale, am I? Let's I be can, honest. <laughs> I can see you at the centre of it. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but I don't know. It's sort of, with Carry On, it's a difficult thing. To, a lot they've tried to bring it back. They're talking about now again, yeah. They're, they're trying, trying to bring it about it again. It's a, risk, it's a big risk, I think. Just phone me. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how are you enjoying working with Al Murray? Yeah, one of the wonderful offshoots of being, a, 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 being successful on Pointless was I was given the chance to be on Al Murray's Great British Pub Quiz. It's on the Quest channel on a Sunday night. It's on Alan Partridge, don't I? Um, <laughs> but I didn't know Quest Apart Discovery, who were massive in America. I didn't realise that. So it's on the Quest channel. It's some good stuff. And uh, basically, I'm his brainy barm, and it's a, bit like, it's a bit like a working class version of Alexander Armstrong and Richard Osmond. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a round called Beat the Barman where I have to come out and I take on one of each team. So uh, we go face to face and they darken the lights like Mastermind and it might be name an African country. So we literally, they ring the bell and we name African countries until someone either bottles it or runs out. So that was great fun. Does anyone ever beat you? I've not seen anyone yeah, beat yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, because some of the subjects, I like name a seaside town with a pier. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, uh, Star Wars characters. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, uh, uh, I think I won 32 and lost eight. It's, it's weird, because Al is himself, and you're the, land, you're the kind of pub landlord in it. Is that, was that a no, deliberate no, no, choice? No, uh, Al doesn't play the pub landlord, he plays Al Murray. Yeah, so he's Which himself. I thought strange at the start, but it sort of works. I think he wanted to get away from that for a minute. I know he was here recently in his brilliant show. I mean, I think if he wants to get away from it, 
don't do a quiz set in a pub. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's a kind of Barry from EastEnders move. <laughs> I, mean, I can take the piss out of him because I know him quite well, so it's all right. Don't worry. He's a lovely fellow. <laughs> but you're the you're the public you're the landlord. Well, you're the, you're the barman. Isn't well, it? I'm the barman. Yeah. yeah. So it, it is like my pub. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm behind the bar. If there's an answer comes up, I explain why it's the answer. So I'm, I'm a bit like Richard Osman on Pointless, and then I come from behind and take on a member of each team. It's very good. It's very it's, it's good. It's a good show. Good show. I'm, I've enjoyed the ones I've seen, uh, and it's great. You know, it's great to see. So you've got this book coming out about quizzing and writing. Well, it, ignorance and, is bliss. Yeah. And anything else in the pipeline that you can talk about? I made a sitcom called Mr. Winner uh, with a young, a young, the, the young lead is called Spencer Jones. It was written by Matt Morgan, who was uh, um, Russell Brand's scriptwriter yeah. uh, uh, many moons ago. And uh, Matt Morgan wrote this brilliant sitcom. It started off as a sort of remake of Some Others Do Have Them, but then it found its own identity. So Spencer Jones plays a Frank Spencer type character uh, who's a, a total nightmare, creates havoc wherever he goes, he plays my son-in-law in it. So he's married to my daughter, so I'm stuffed, so I have to employ him. And he wrecks my business, really, and creates havoc in my life. But... So that should come out in October. Great. OK, cool. Well, look, it's been really fantastic to have you. I knew, you you'd, I knew you'd be awesome on this. Uh, and you are. Uh, didn't ask about your hair transplant. There isn't time. <laughs> I mean, I don't think, really, don't think you've had one. Uh, that's what I wanted to ask you. <laughs> um, really fantastic you're a great guy and I hope you never get lost up Snowden again ladies and gentlemen Thank you, Sean you. Williamson the paramedic from EastEnders we'll be back next week come, come again to see the show next week in about 20 minutes How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>